This is the Weekly Set, the official podcast of TVEnthusiast.com. Episode 60, recorded June 9, 2016. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Weekly Set, the official podcast of TVEnthusiast.com. I am your host and editor-in-chief of TV Enthusiast, Tyson Gifford, and joining me today, as always, is our keeper of comics, Will Rowrig. Hello. So today we're going to go over a little bit of news, then we're going to talk about uh, two shows that we're kind of adding into the rotation, and then we're going to talk about Peaky Blinders, which is the one show that we're committed to that we're going to watch every week. Uh, so let's start off with some news. Uh, first up, Superman's gonna show up in Supergirl. Crazy, huh? Crazy. I, it's crazy. I, are you sure they're allowed to do this? <laughs> Maybe this has to do with Jeff Johns kind of becoming the Kevin Feige, Kevin Feige of, of DC. Yeah. Like right. maybe he's kind of more open to the idea of, cause we've talked before about how it's really hypocritical the way that, um, they'll be like, uh, no, you can't use Deadshot because we're going to make a Deadshot movie. Oh, guess what? We're also going to make a Flash movie and we're going to have our own Flash. We're and it's Barry that. Allen too. That's Barry Allen, but they can still have the Barry Allen Flash TV show. It's really inconsistent, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's inconsistent, and it seems like a slap in the face on the, of the TV side, um, which is kind of funny because as much as we've been kind of upset with the way um, Arrow's been running, I think for the most part, the TV shows have much more goodwill than the movies do right now. Arrow is only Arrow because they couldn't make it a Batman TV show. Yeah. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> so the, the big two, the two they said you could never do were, were Batman and Superman, basically. And Superman's been shown, shown up on Supergirl, but kind of like in the distance as like a un, you know, like not, not an important character to the story, really, you know? Uh, we just kind of see him in the background. You didn't even have a full actor for him. No, like spoken dialogue, nothing, you know? But now they're bringing him on. And it's when the show's moved over to the CW from CBS, which to me says like they're trying to get more comic booky with, uh, Supergirl make it fit in more with the other shows but by bringing in superman as an actual actor on the show that's that's a good move that that might mean that this kind of uh weird disparity between the tv and the movies uh with yeah. the dc universes the weird like you know we won't let you use certain characters on tv but what we can use all of them in the movies um might be coming to an end well hopefully hopefully because uh, i was gonna say hopefully we get nightwing on arrow and then i'm like wait i'm not watching that anymore so i don't care anymore <laughs> so see they'll bring they'll bring batman to arrow yeah and then, and then he'll fall in love with felicity damn it <laughs> <laughs> you know it's gonna happen you know it's gonna happen it is, that's gonna be the hook of uh uh felicity i mean arrow season seven <laughs> Will be Batman falling in love with Felicity. Um, I don't think I have mixed feelings about this because one thing it, it like I guess it it further promotes the idea of like Kara living in like Kal-El shadow, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, having him pre- be a presence on the show might de- might detract from her, you know, being like the center point in the show in in a way. It could, it, it could. It, it depends on how they handle it because they did something interesting with Superman in the. Because I know you you only watched like the pilot and the crossover, or the Flash crossover episode, right? Yeah. So um, I'm gonna like put a little bit of a spoiler about the season finale because even if you want to start watching Supergirl next season, you don't really have to watch the first season. Okay, well that's it's very procedural, you know. Yeah. So this this spoiler shouldn't be an issue, but. The one thing they did that was kind of cool, uh, was they had, um, uh, they had this huge threat to the earth where like basically all of the people on earth were kind of like being, or not on earth, but like in the city that Kara's in were being like kind of controlled, like mentally by some kind of a, like, um, the signal sent through a satellite dish by somebody who is connected to Brainiac, but not really Brainiac. <laughs> it's kind of confusing to get into, but, uh, basically they were like controlling all the people. 
Um, the exceptions were Kara, who for some reason was immune, Kat, who was given these like earrings or something that protected her, and the one kind of like villain guy on the show who's like the, or quasi villain on the show, kind of like the Lex Luthor of the show, um, who had given Kat the earrings and had also d- done something to protect himself because he saw that this was going to happen. Um, and so, uh, Superman comes to help Kara in the situation because it's such a huge thing. Oh. And he flies into the city and is immediately also under control. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and the idea is like Kara wasn't under control, but he was. And they explain it that because Kara, um, had been on uh, Earth for less time, like Clark had basically spent his entire life on Earth. And like, that's why. Like, it had to do with that. It had to do with growing up on Earth versus growing up on Krypton. Like, people that d- didn't spend their entire life on Earth, basically, that were from Krypton were like immune to it. But like, Clark, who'd spent his entire life on it, like, had adapted in a way that the others hadn't um, and then was vulnerable to the same thing. Okay, sure. Uh (laughs) (laughs) So, in a way, they basically found a way to make Kara more important than Superman in that part. Right, right. So, there there is a way where you can do that, where you can say, like, okay, you know, like, you know, she doesn't have to live in the shadow. There's things that she can do maybe that he can't. And that's, like, one example. But there's other things that can kind of bring up. And and he's not going to be, like, a main character on the show either. Um, He'll be, like, recurring at best. So... I don't think it, it'll be as much of an issue. I think they're still committed to making her seem more important, but um yeah, I can see I can see the the consequences, the possible consequences if they make her kind of live in a shadow. Right. But are you gonna watch Supergirl next season? I might. I might. Um you know what? You know, definitely now that I'm not watching Arrow, there is an open slot, so yeah, why not? <laughs> also also since it's gonna be on CW, that means they're gonna put the episodes up on Hulu, unlike with what happened with CBS, so it'll be a lot easier for me to watch. So yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'll start watching it next year. Yeah. Um I I'm really interested to see if they change it because Supergirl really did feel like a CBS show. Uh-huh. With like a little bit of a CW twist you know um so i'm really interested to see if this is going to kind of become more like of all of the the arrowverse shows like it's probably closest to like the flash as far as like being more heightened because you have a character with like superpowers versus you know just the vigilante right. and stuff so i wonder if they're going to push it more in that direction and make it more flash like in the sense that it's going to be less about less the way it was in the first season less procedural less you know kind of monster of the week and going to like a larger story so i wonder if that's what's going to happen so I'm, I'm really curious to see i think of all of the shows i'm probably of all of the arrowverse shows i'm probably most curious about what supergirl is going to be like yeah i'm most curious too i'm, I'm most curious about about that crossover they announced <laughs> yeah because she's like in a whole different world so they have to figure something out there yeah because this is apparently going to involve everybody so yeah so like are they going to merge her universe with the Arrowverse. Are well, isn't the story they're doing in Flash called uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths in the comic? No, and it's called it Fla- it's called Flashpoint. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they had like a wink and a like the ending to this season of Flash was like sort of a wink and a nod to Crisis on Infinite Earths. Uh, but they but they didn't like go all out and like fully do it. Uh, hmm. We'll have to see. Maybe, maybe they will. <laughs> maybe Barry's major derp. <laughs> maybe they'll just combine Flashpoint and Crisis on Infinite Earths. Like, yeah. Flashpoint did sort of lead to, like, the entire, like, new 52, like, line reboot of DC Comics. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe. Which, which is now, like, being, like, sort of kind of rebooted, reset it in, with Rebirth. Yeah. I heard about that. I've been hearing about the crazy stuff going on in comics, both both DC and Marvel. Oh yeah, yeah. Rebirth. Uh, Rebirth is resetting the new Fifty Two to a new sta- status quo, and that all apparently that all apparently comes out of Flashpoint. And so, apparently, Superman was in Hydra all along. Yeah, Superman was in Hydra. Actually, DC <laughs> is like going full crazy with this stuff. They're like, uh, there's three Jokers now. 
Um, <laughs> there, there is, uh, the, the new, the, the new 52 Superman is dead. And apparently the pre new 52 universe Superman was living incognito in the new 52 universe. And so now he's, now that Superman's dead, he's going to step up and be Superman again. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't the new 52 like, um, Batman, like not wanting to be Batman anymore or something? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah that's, that's all weird. All, it's all, it's all stuff to draw from. It's all crazy. It's all stuff to draw from for, for these shows. You know, they, like, it's, it's the nature of it. So they can do, like, all kinds of crazy things that they can do to make it work. Um, <laughs> you know. So, uh, uh, in other news, the only other story I wanted to go over, we, we have, of course, a newscast that I'm going to be putting up tomorrow, uh, where we're going to go into a lot more of the news because there was a lot of news this week, just not a lot of really, really big news that's so more podcast focused. But the other thing I wanted to bring up is, uh, a few weeks back, we did our summer preview and one of the shows I was most interested in, but didn't really have much to go by. So we didn't have anything to talk about for it was, uh, a series called Stranger Things, which is coming to Netflix. Well, the trailer just dropped. So now we've been able to watch it and get kind of our first impressions of it. What did you think? It looks, it looks great. It, it looks like sort of like a mishmash between like a Stephen King story and like, and like 80s kids adventures movies. Like, like think, think like, E.T. or like the Goonies, like yeah, Monster Squad, or yeah, you, know, you know, and then combine that with like it, or maybe you know, like maybe even like Stand by Me or something, you know, like so it's or uh or what's another one? Uh, silver Bullet. Uh, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. It does yeah. have kind of a Silver Bullet vibe to it. Oh, like so, so definitely it, it 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 definitely has that like vibe to it. Um, and so much so that I expected it to like be set in Maine. <laughs> 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 Might be. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is, uh, what's really interesting about this show to me is that when I first heard about this show, um, there wasn't much to go on to like write about it or talk about like any content from the show, but basically people are saying this is going to be a weird show. There's going to be a little bit of a Twin Peaks vibe, which you could kind of see in the trailer a little bit. Um, it's not like full on Twin Peaks, uh, but yeah. you can see a little bit of a Twin Peaks vibe going on. Um, but yeah, uh, watching the trailer, I had no idea about the kind of more like 80s kid adventure, like, you know, Stephen King, like coming of age aspects. And that made me look like really excited for this. Um, especially even when just like the title card came up at the end, it was like very retro looking. Yeah. That, that, just like that 80s was, movie look yeah, to it. That was definitely like an 80s font, you know? Yeah. It, it's like they're, they're definitely going for that feel. And you, you know, and people, <laughs> you know, you can criticize it, you know, it's, it's cynically nostalgic, um, for nostalgia's sake. You know, but I, I like it. Yeah. I mean, I, I like old eighties kind of adventure movies. I mean, not too long ago, I, I rewatched, uh, Adventures in Babysitting because it was on. And I was like, ah, oh, this just was so fun. The kind of movies they had back then. Um, and then just like last night or something, I watched, uh, Cloak and Dagger. Did you, do you remember the old eighties Cloak and Dagger movie? Yeah. Yeah. About like the kid that like was obsessed with spies. Oh, Jesus. I remember that. Yeah. I always got that confused with like the Marvel Cloak and Dagger because like I would, I would hear about that and be like, oh shit. They no, made, this, this is the one about the kid that. who gets like a video game and there's you like a, an Atari game. It's yeah. so awesome. <laughs> and there's like a secret hidden in it and he's like, he's got this imaginary friend that's like this spy that from a game he plays. Yep. And yeah, that's, uh, um, I was just watching that again and you know, like I'm like, man, there's some aspects of this that are really cheesy and don't hold up well. There's other aspects where I'm like, I can't believe they got away with this in a kid's movie or like I can't believe like they're, um, you know, like the kids like basically crying wolf left and right. Like these people are trying to kill me, but he's like serious, you know? And then like nobody even pays attention that this kid's like running away and there's adults chasing him. It's like at the very least you'd think they'd be going like, there's somebody trying to molest this kid or, you know, <laughs> it's like you just, that wouldn't make sense in like a, a modern movie, I don't think, but it's, it's fun watching a movie like that and just kind of going like, oh yeah, this is, this is kind of older way of doing it and seeing like the old title cards too, which just reminded me like when I saw Stranger Things trailer and saw that title card pop up, I instantly thought of like the cloak and dagger title card coming up in that movie so yeah. uh 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for this. It's a Netflix show. You know what? This looks like the perfect kind of show to binge, too. Like, it's an adventure that kind of, like, you know, there's, con- like, you'd be watching it, and then some new wrinkle would come into the thing, and it's like, instead of waiting for a week, just, just jump right into the next one and keep your addiction going, you know? Right, definitely. So, I'm kind of excited. I want to binge watch this show. Um, let's move on from news though and let's talk about some stuff we've been watching. So I've seen the first two episodes of Preacher. They've been out now. You saw the first episode. Um, you had said before that you didn't read the comics, but you were kind of like vaguely aware of them. Yeah. And what was going on with them. I, yeah, I was aware of them through like reading like Wizard Magazine. Mm-hmm. What did you think of the show? Um, interesting. Interesting. I don't, I honestly, I, I don't know if, uh, I don't know how I feel about it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like they're toning it down a little bit from the comics. I haven't read the comics either. I just, I have a lot of friends that have, um, but from things I've heard from the comics versus this, they're toning it down a little bit, but like in a way that's kind of making it better, it seems to me. Um, some of the things I've heard that they've toned down, I'm like, I'm kind of glad they toned that down. <laughs> Not because I can't handle kind of extreme crazy things, but because I think it would detract from like um, the story and actually caring about characters in the show and stuff. But um, like, what aspects of it did you like before you get into what you're unsure of? Oh, what aspects did I like? Um, I I guess I just didn't like, you know, like like how edgy it is. I guess you, mm-hmm. you know, it's like it's like no, I get it. Like that's how the comic was. That's like that that's Garth Ennis's whole style. Then you combine that with like Evan Goldberg and Seth Rogen, and it's like it 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 it's <laughs> really it, it really comes off as off putting. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, okay, I mean, it's certain things like, uh, like, I guess, like, the beginning, like, when it's, like, space, and it shows, like, this goofy, like, 1950s version of space, mm-hmm. and I'm just, like, right off the bat, like, it's, like, the show telling you, don't take this seriously. It's like, <laughs> okay, I won't. <laughs> yeah, they they really are trying to kind of set the tone right at the beginning to say, like, this is going to be a weird show. Yeah. Like, you know, like, don't, don't expect the kind of gritty, like, you know, the walk King Dead fair that you might be expecting. <laughs> you know, that's, right. that's not what this is. That's what the, this is. A, <laughs> yeah, this is a very weird show. Uh, the, it's, it's very weird in like tone. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not grounded. If you're expecting like, a, like, like, and this is what makes it weird because like, like it acts, it acts like it's grounded, mm-hmm. but, then, but, but then it's not. And it doesn't really <laughs> care. It, it, it doesn't really care about like, introducing like these supernatural elements you know to this like like they just happen like like there's a vampire it's not like they explain it it's not like it, it's not like they explain it. It's not like they take their time to introduce it or anything or that's, even. That's just part of this world. Yeah, the, the, there's just a vampire, <laughs> and 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 apparently there are people who knew vampires exist and were actively trying to kill this vampire. And they're like religious zealots, all of them. Yeah, and it's like I kind of dug that though. I dug that he like went to the bathroom, pulls out the Bible, is thumbing through it, and you just see like, wow, these people are really into the Bible. <laughs> yeah, really into the Bible. Yeah. No, I I dug that scene i like that that whole scene on the plane like i really dug that i thought that was cool i just i'm just like, like the, the wine bottle decanter like it it just happens with no warning like there there's no hints that there's going to be vampires in the show then all of a sudden we cut to an airplane there's this guy he goes into the bathroom and oh he's a vampire did you know that no <laughs> we, we didn't even bother to set that up for you it just happened <laughs> he's probably the best character on the show so far, so far, I agree. Yes, he's my favorite character on the show. <laughs> he's a, the actor was in uh, Misfits. He was great in that. Um, if anybody is interested in seeing that guy and more stuff, he came in, I think, on the um, either the second or third season of Misfits. Um, but yeah, uh, he was hilarious in that show. And he's great here as well. So I really like his character. I like that he jumped out of an airplane with an umbrella. I love that. I love that. I love the next time you see him, he's like all splattered in like a crater on the ground. You know, his like entrails are freaking hanging out. 
<laughs> yeah, and the, um, the umbrella is just was obviously completely pointless sitting next to him, just like turned inside out. <laughs> like some part of him thought that would work. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was great. Um, I, I liked that aspect of the show. I also really liked Tulip, uh, the female character from, uh, the, the girl from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's right. That's why I reckon, cause I, ca- I saw her. I'm like, she was in something. She was definitely in something. I can't <laughs> place it, but she was in something. You just gotta imagine her in a dress. You know, yeah. Those, like weird dresses or whatever. <laughs> Tulip was cool. I, I thought the, the scene, like, with Lewitt, the kids, you know, like, that was a little on the nose about we, you know, I, we get it, woman power, or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's getting to a point now, it, it's annoying when they do it, cause it's, it's transparent now. It's like, that wasn't even trying to be subtle. That was just transparent and annoying. It's like, like, she could be cool without stopping to tell the audience, hey, I'm a woman and women can be cool. You know? <laughs> yeah. You no, know, I mean, come on. Let's, let's stop doing this, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassing at this point. Yeah, I, I I I can agree with you there, but um, I still like her character. I yeah, I like um, her character. She's really funny, and it's really funny. Like, oh my god, the whole sequence, like where she's like building a bazooka and she goes out, and again, this is like we're in a heightened sort of reality. You know, this is another thing where where it's like you're not supposed to be taking this show that seriously because she goes out, you know, you hear all this stuff. She's taken down like a helicopter. <laughs> with stuff she just found lying around the house you know it's like <laughs> yeah well see that's the thing though is i know like i heard some people referring to that scene and saying like yeah you can see that they cut corners on the budget with this scene by having it just be on the kids faces i'm like that was perfect that was like, perfect. If they had showed that if they had shown that scene like her blowing up it just would have been boring you know and yeah. been like oh, okay it was just a michael bay movie like who cares you know but having it just be focused on the kids and like she's like I'm gonna go out there and do something and then like cuts it and you see their faces and you just hear the stuff and see their faces just made it perfect you know I don't I don't think I would have liked it if they had shown everything as much as I liked the way they did it this way yeah um uh let me see what else uh I guess that's in general I kind of covered most of what I talked about about Preacher okay. um, I like the show uh second episode not as good as the pilot it opens up with like another kind of wholly random like okay now all of a sudden without spoiling anything uh because it isn't really a spoiler yet um but uh it just like it opens up on like a flashback to like the 1800s oh okay with no explanation about how it links <laughs> <laughs> like nothing at all. Like the second episode ends and there's still absolutely no explanation as to where this, where this, uh, flashback cut intersects. <laughs> and, and in some ways I kind of like that. I mean, I, I know what the flashback is just because I have so many friends that were huge in the comics that I was like, okay, I, I know from them talking about it what this is. But, uh, at the same time, like, even if I didn't, I think I kind of, I'm intrigued enough by just how, like, weird that is. I, that might just be me, though. I'm, I'm into, like, stuff being kind of weird and, like, what the fuck? And, like, I have to think about it and wonder what's going on, you know? So, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to more of it. I've seen the first two. Episode three comes out this weekend. Are you going to watch any more Preacher? Um, yeah, I'll probably, I'll probably watch the second episode. Yeah, I always give shows a shot beyond the pilot, you know? Mm hmm. Um, and we have another show that you watched, uh, the first episode on. Now, this is a series that's currently on its third season, I believe. Um, I'm a few episodes behind, but we're not going to get anywhere near that point because you've just seen the first episode so far. Uh, so tell me, what did you think of Penny Dreadful? Uh, Penny Dreadful, I, I enjoyed it. Like, like at first, like when it was like first starting, I'm just like, I don't know about this, but you know, you actually sit down and watch it. it, it once it gets going, it's like, like, this is good. This is, <laughs> this is good. I enjoyed that. I'm trying to remember, how did the first episode end? Um, ended with Frankenstein. Okay. Yeah. I just I'll, wanted to make, I thought that was the first episode, but I wasn't sure. It's like, 
Which, like, I guess, like, I don't know if, like, him, like, saying he was Frankenstein at the very end was supposed to be an oh shit moment, because obviously once he reanimated the corpse and the way he was, like, obsessing over shit stuff, like, the entire episode, it, it was pretty obvious. But it's <laughs> <laughs> What do you uh, think about the way the show just kind of takes all of these literary? It, it's to me, it almost feels like, um, uh, like a League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Like it just has all of these characters from fiction, you know? <laughs> yeah, but, and it's like it's the same characters in some cases because it wasn't like Dorian Gray was in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Or... Yeah, well, League of Extra, it is the same characters basically because like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, the concept was to take all these literary characters from late. 19th century, you know, English literature and put them all into like a team, you know. So, like, this is just using the same characters from the same literature. So, I mean, I, I, I can see where you would get that vibe because it's sort of like the same basic concept, except they're not teaming up into like a superhero team. No, <laughs> it's just like this kind of Victorian horror story instead. Yeah, it's sort of Victorian horror story instead. Um, but, but no, I, I thought, this, I thought, this, I, so far, I thought it's pretty cool how they're bringing like these characters together. Like, mm-hmm. like apparently, like uh, the 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 main guy there, his daughter is Nina Harker. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and, Timothy. Uh, uh, I can't even think of his last name. Yeah, Dalton. Timothy Dalton. Yeah, James Bond. Bond. Yeah, James Bond's daughter is <laughs> Nina Harker. Um, I thought that was pretty freaking cool. Um, and then uh, of course you have Victor Frankenstein is in it. Uh, and uh, you know, I just loved like the vampires in this, like how they depicted vampires was like really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, Especially that one that looked like really freaky. Uh, <laughs> I think when you get into witches, I think the witches look even cooler. Oh really? Oh, yeah. dude, I can't wait for that. Like, so yeah, I'm I'm uh, uh I I think this I think the second season's better than the first season. Um, third season it's I'm still too early in. Like I'm a, I'm like three episodes behind. And I've only seen like two or three episodes. Um, but yeah, that it's definitely I think the second season was my favorite so far of the bunch. But um yeah uh i like i love the look of the film or the not the film the show in general yeah Uh, it's really well shot i love the the look of victorian london um as it's presented in the show and it just it's gorgeous oh yeah it's gorgeous yeah it looks great um yeah so uh you'll have to tell me more as you as you continue to watch the series what you think about it oh yeah definitely let's move on and let's talk about our featured topic our continuing discussion of peaky blinder so today we're going to be talking about episode five if you want to watch along with us we're watching one episode a week so episode five this week episode six next week uh uh, this time, uh, I think the biggest thing we can say um, right up front is that we get to meet Arthur Shelby Sr., a real prince of a man. Yeah, he kind of like shows up unexpectedly. <laughs> He's played by uh, Tommy Flanagan, who um, some people might know as Chibs in Sons of Anarchy. Uh, he's, he's a Irish actor, not Irish actor, Scottish actor that he kind of shows up in a lot of roles. Um, you'll just, he's one of those actors that, you know, you, once you take notice of him once, you'll just see him at everything. Like, oh, there he is again. Oh, there he is again. <laughs> uh, he just one of those people. He has one of those faces. Those scars on his face are real. Um, he has like a Glasgow smile. The actor does. Uh, it's an injury he received about 20 years ago. Um, and that's part of what makes him just a really interesting casting choice for anything he's in pretty much just looks alone. He has that look to him, you know? Um, when I was talking to you about it earlier, you had brought up that you thought that the scars were prosthetic. They were just like makeup. And it was just to kind of imply like, oh, this character is, he's kind of like this old time criminal and been around a bit. And right. I, I thought it was like, you know, like, like it was something that like added to his character, like a visual cue that added to his character, which I thought was kind of ingenious because, you know, like, like instead of just like explaining like character, you know, you could like have something visually about a character that's interesting without mm-hmm. really referencing or mentioning it. And like, you know, that could get you to think, I thought, well, that's, that's neat. Um, it is interesting, but it's interesting in like a way where you thank the casting department rather than the makeup or the. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> He's one of those actors with just a really interesting scar that makes him more interesting when they cast him in other things, you know, because you either have to explain it or you have to kind of create a circumstance in which the audience could understand this is a character that would have this kind of scar. Uh, another example would be if people have watched The Wire, the, the actor who played Omar in The Wire has a, a giant scar going across his face um, and everything he's been in, you know, like it kind of has to fit into his role somehow. Right, right, uh, exactly. So it's just, uh, he's one of those actors. It's just a very interesting and memorable face. Um, so he came back, like I said, real prince of a man. <laughs> uh, it's very clear up front. Uh, Tommy absolutely hates him. Um, yeah, yeah, Arthur yeah. Jr. is like, wants to believe in him. Yeah, um, he wants to believe in him. Um, he, Polly seems to be kind of like, yeah, I've been through this before. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, we'll get into this right now because it was like a B plot of the story before we get into the main story. But basically, Arthur Shelby Jr.'s role or Sr.'s role in this uh, episode is he just kind of shows up randomly. He convinces uh, Arthur Jr. to uh, give him some money so they can set up a place in Atlantic City, uh, the Shelby Casino, and make their mark, you know, and, and Arthur uh, Jr. is like all for it. He's getting kind of fed up with Tommy and he, he wants to kind of, you know, make his mark on his own and kind of be like, you know, I'm a Shelby too. I, I can make a business choice. Gets a bunch of money, gives it to him. His dad says, meet me at the boxing ring on uh, Saturday. Uh, Arthur Jr. shows up there. Uh, his father never shows up. Ends up catching him at the trains when he's about to leave. And his dad's like, yeah, I just spent it on horse. Uh, I'm taking off now. Don't touch me or I'll slit your throat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, he's, he's, he's like, uh, he's, he's a father fit for Game of Thrones. <laughs> uh, but let's get under like the kind of main story besides, uh, Arthur just basically making himself look like an idiot. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, the main kind of stuff happening in this episode stems off of the, what happened at the end of the last episode, uh, which is, uh, Freddy was arrested and everyone seems to think it was Tommy that did it. And we know as the audience that it wasn't. We know it was Grace, uh, leaked the info to Inspector Chester and that Chester is the one that organized that and took him and Tommy had nothing to do with it. But, Everybody thinks it's Tommy. Yeah. There's everybody. even a scene where Tommy goes and talks to Inspector Chester himself and Chester's like, well, everybody seems to be pointing the finger at you when, when Tommy asks who yeah. gave the information and. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's like, yeah. Tommy's like, oh, since we're getting along, you know, you know who, uh, sold out. And he's like, oh, well, everybody seems to think it's you. <laughs> Which is Tommy is just not happy about, <laughs> understandably. Um, but yeah, so, uh, this episode dealing kind of with the consequences of that and everything going on, uh, Grace ends up <laughs> continuing to, to, to be a thorn in the Shelby side without them realizing it. Uh, she ends up figuring out, uh, the location of the guns thanks to a big slip up by Arthur, <laughs> who's just showed himself to be a true moron this episode. <laughs> yeah. Who basically refers to, uh, talks about, um, God, I thought I had his name written down here. I guess I don't. Uh, Whizbang, <laughs> who we saw in the first episode, the one that Tommy pretended to kill and sent off, uh, on a mission to London. Basically by revealing that he, um, was alive and that they had buried something in his place and then acting kind of coy only when she asked what was buried there, she was able to put one and two together and figure out, oh, that's where the guns are. So she leaked that information to Inspector Campbell. He dug up the grave, retrieved all but one of the guns, apparently. Yeah, it was all but one of the guns. And then they kind of immediately plan their assault on the Shelby's at that point. Um, I got I got to toot my own horn here, toot toot. Uh, I was right. Uh, Chester had a uh, Chester Campbell had uh, feelings for Grace. <laughs> 
you in were the right. cringiest scenes I've ever seen. Oh, that, that was Spring Central when that happened. I was like, oh, I, the whole time that scene was gone, I was like, make it in, make it in. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like, awkward. <laughs> you kind of had to feel bad for Grace because she's just like trying to deal with it in the nicest way possible. You, you can see like as soon as he starts, like her eyes like glass over and she's just like, what is even happening right now? <laughs> <laughs> and then she said she said, Look, Jora, I I mean Inspector Campbell, yeah. I just don't have feelings for you. <laughs> 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 it's like, yeah. uh, I think I think that's that's interesting, uh, because because that informs like the back half, of, like like the like the entire like plot going forward is now informed by this like one cringeworthy scene <laughs> where like he reveals he has feelings for Grace. It's like because otherwise the show ends. Otherwise, like he's got the guns. Mission is accomplished. He promised not to go after Tom, Thomas. You know, like yeah, it felt like it's a season finale. It felt like a season finale. So, like, if if he didn't have like this weird freaking crush for Grace, um, then there's no reason for him to continue on. Except now we had now we have motivation, and now things just got turned up to eleven. Yeah. So that means uh, Chester Campbell feels uh, scorned. He's uh, upset. He uh stalking um Grace and sees that she's with Thomas. Um uh, when he when he knows that uh the two of them are together, he calls off the rest of his troops. Uh and that's why everybody thinks all of the Shelby's think, oh, they're in the clear now, everything's fine because the police have left down or like the, the agents have left down. Of course we know uh in the audience that Chester Campbell this has become something personal to him. So uh he hasn't left town. He doesn't have the same um capacities he had before as far as like having the backing of an army, but he's like on kind of like a vendetta now. Yeah, he, this is personal now. This is a vendetta. And it's like, right. get over it, dude. <laughs> she doesn't yeah. want you. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't doesn't like you. Just get past it. it just get past it. <laughs> yeah, really. It's like so this, he's he he's gonna get Tommy and either kill him or put him away, and then she's gonna love him forever. <laughs> Uh, at least he doesn't show up on Arrow because he'd fall in love with Felicity. No, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I know he falls. It's all Chester Campbell, the new villain on Arrow. He falls yeah. in love with Felicity, and then he vows to get Oliver Queen. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean that's that's pretty much it in a nutshell. That covers uh episode five. We're one episode away from the this was the penultimate of the season. Next episode is the season finale. Um, so expecting we're, fireworks. We're expecting shit to really get real. Um yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's gonna be probably a real action packed, crazy episode. I'm expecting probably a few character deaths. <laughs> that just seems to be the way things are heading. Uh, we'll have to see what ends up happening with that. Uh, one thing we didn't mention, uh, the IRA came back in this episode. Yeah, that's a pretty big thing to mention. The IRA came back. There's this big scene. That's what, where Thomas was talking with Chester about that, you know, like, he's got like this, this guy's a pretty big shot in the IRA, right? That's going after Thomas. He's going after Thomas because of the guns. Uh, Thomas goes to Chester, promises that they'll lead him into a trap and that Chester will catch him and he'll get that medal. Um, and one of the big things about the episode is, you know, like, like Thomas is in the bar and he's waiting for them to come. He's expect they're going to come and they're going to kill Thomas. And mm -hmm. he had, he had just, he had, apparently he had just found out that instead, instead of a parlay, uh, they were going to come and he was going to give the location of the guns and then they were going to kill him. Um, so he prepares for that by having, giving Grace a gun, telling her to go hide until he gives a signal and she's going to come out holding a gun at them, you know, so that Thomas can save 
basically save his ass from being killed. But great performance by Killian Murphy going from being in such a panic to like sitting down and having his face calm over as yeah. he gets ready for them to come. That that is amazing. That was like a that that entire scene was amazing. It was like so tense from beginning to end. It was like the tension, and then when Grace does come out and she instantly she she just shoots the one guy dead uh, because you know because because she has a vendetta against the IRA, you know, because mm-hmm. of what they did, unbeknownst to Thomas, you know, he doesn't know about that. So she comes out and she's filled, you know, she see, she, she sees these men from the IRA and that fills her with, you know, rage to the point where she, she comes out instead of pointing the gun, like as planned, she comes out firing. Um, yeah. And and then that leads to a struggle between Thomas and the other guy, the main guy, and and that ends pretty brutally. Thomas like bashes his head in once yeah. he gets the upper hand. He's uh, getting Thomas is getting strangled by the guy. Yeah, it's not going well for Thomas. Thomas starts having another one of his like PTSD like war flashbacks, and then just goes way over the top aggressive and just yeah, just caves the guy's head in. Yeah, he just loses it and caves he, the guy's he gives head. him the old Ober and Mark. Yeah, <laughs> the old over in Martel. Crazy. Um, that was probably the best scene of the episode, to be honest. Yeah. I, I noticed we had skipped over it just because we were focusing on the more major plot threads going into the finale. But yeah, that was that was a really great scene, like the way it was put together. Yep, that was a really great scene, the way it was put together. Just, again, beautiful cin- cinematography in this episode. Just wonderful. Um, yeah, great episode. Great episode. This, this felt like, easily felt like the season finale. Um, <laughs> it easily could have been. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of excited to see how they take it up a notch for like the next episode. This is the first time watching the show where the, as the episode was airing, I kept going like, I do, I don't want to watch beyond here because I don't want to have advanced knowledge when we discuss it. You know, I don't want to know more than Will does when we're discussing this episode. But part of me was like, watch the next episode, watch the next episode. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like where I really just wanted to jump right into the next episode. By the, by the end, I didn't really feel that as much. It wasn't because it wasn't as good. It's just they ended it in this kind of clever way where instead of like a big cliff hanger going into the season finale they ended it like as if it had this happy you know happy season ending or something um but of course we know that there's something brewing under the surface that's unresolved and that's what we're gonna get in the season finale but that kind of was i thought it was gonna end before that and i was like right on the edge of my seat like oh you know (laughs) i'm gonna need to watch this next episode and i'm like no i gotta hold off and so thankfully i was able to hold off and i'm very much looking forward to watching Watching the season finale and discussing it next week. Yep, definitely. Me too. So that's it for us. That's uh, Peaky Blinders. If you want to watch Peaky Blinders along with us, we will be discussing episode six of season one, the season one finale, uh, next week. So you can watch along with us. You can send us comments or questions or anything you want related to that or anything else we talk about on the show. Just send them to contact at tventhusiast.com or the weekly set at tventhusiast.com or to any of our Twitter handles or comments on the YouTube. YouTube, you know, video that this is being put up as, or in the SoundCloud, wherever. <laughs> Where, wherever there is an, a place where you could leave a comment for us that we'll find, leave one for us and we'll uh, bring it up on the show. Uh, until then, thank you everybody for listening. Night. Night. If you would like to voice your opinion, send an email to the weekly set at tventhusiast.com. TV Enthusiast is a part of the Enthusiast Media Network. Stay tuned to TV Enthusiast and the Weekly Set Podcast for more coverage of all 